Hey class, today we're going to talk about the structure of Congress and what that's going to entail is talking about the requirements to serve uh, for both House members and Senate members, uh, the uh, number of House members, the number of senators, uh, what Illinois' district map looks like, and then also we're going to talk uh, most of the time uh, for this lesson, we're going to talk about the similarities and differences of the House and Senate. And this is really the crucial part of the uh, notes to take today. Uh, it's not to say the rest isn't important. Uh, it's just to say that the emphasis really should be uh, placed on the differences between the House and the Senate and, of course, the similarities. So let's begin. With regard to the requirements to serve, the uh, Constitution, Article 1, uh, lays out the provisions and qualifications for a House member. Uh, no person shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of 25 years of age, or 25 years, seven years a citizen, uh, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. So that you've got to be 25 or older, seven years a citizen of the United States, and a resident of the state. When elected, note a uh, couple caveats. Uh, I want you to ask yourself, why do you think it was a 25 years or older? Um, I want you to think about why seven years of citizen would be sufficient. Uh, and then I'd like you to think about why you got to be a resident of the state as opposed to the district in which you wish to represent. Um, and if you think back to that uh, game, the uh, redistricting game that you had the opportunity to play, uh, that might give you an answer as to why the state residency is sufficient as opposed to just being a part of a district. Uh, with regards to the Senate, the uh, U.S. Constitution lays out the requirements there as well. 30 years or older, nine years a citizen, and of course a resident of the state when elected. And again, consider why the age uh, requirement's a little different. Consider why the citizenship is a little higher. Uh, and of course, the residency is going to be a similar answer uh, between the House and the Senate. But I'd like you to consider those ideas. Uh, with regard to the number of members, in the House of Representatives, there are 435 voting members and six non-voting members. The Constitution lays out that uh, states are represented in the House of Representatives. And that means the District of Columbia, since it's not a state, doesn't get a, rep uh, doesn't get a representative, nor do any of the territories, uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and so on. Uh, so those districts and territories instead are represented by non-voting members. And so that's a important uh, distinction uh, to recall. So uh, our 10th district congressman is Brad Schneider. And if you're interested in looking through the uh, Illinois delegates, I will post the link on Google Classroom for you. Uh, the Illinois members, there's 18 uh, congressmen and, of course, two senators. Uh, there are 13 Democrats and five Republicans, if my recollection is correct. And then, of course, both of our senators are Democrats as well. In the Senate, there are 100 members, two from each state. Uh, and since we, have, of course, have 50 states, we have 100 senators. Uh, currently, the Illinois members are uh, Dick Durbin, who's up for re-election this year, and Tammy Duckworth, who uh, was elected back in the, after the 2018 election cycle. Now, of course, senators represent states, the entirety of the state interest, the interests of the state. In fact, as you, you probably recall from U.S. history, uh, senators originally, under the Constitution, were... Uh, selected by the state legislatures. They are not directly elected by the people themselves. Uh, House members, on the other hand, are elected from a district. And this map shows you the 2010 
redistricting of Illinois. Uh, all 18 districts um, are represented on the map. Of course, the zoom in here is of the uh, uh, Chicago metropolitan area. Of course, this is going to be all redistricted over the next uh, year or two. Um, but suffice to say that this is what the map is for the 2020 election and has been for the past 10 years. Uh, as you can see on this map, some of the districts are huge. Okay, the 17th district runs the uh, entire extent of the western uh, chunk of Illinois, for example, along the Mississippi River. Uh, contrast that with the uh, 4th district here in um, part of uh, the west side of Chicago on Wood Park. And it is a heavily gerrymandered district that goes all the way out into the western suburbs before sliding back into the south suburbs in Cicero. Uh, this is a gerrymandered district as a result of the 2010 uh, redistricting. Um, it was found to be constitutional uh, by, uh, by the courts uh, when it was challenged by the Republicans who were getting um, messed with in the 2010 redistricting. Now let's compare the chambers. And again, this is a this is kind of the meat of this uh, video. The House of Representatives is the chamber of majority power. It is designed to be that. Okay, and remember when uh, earlier in the semester we talked about this concept of democracy is in its extreme form, unbridled democracy is essentially mob rule. Uh, well, the majority party in the House of Representatives has all the power, okay? Uh, they set the agenda, they control, they, since it's a straight up majority vote, they win every election or, or every uh, vote. And if they don't, then there's a crisis in leadership in the House of Representatives because the speaker should never call a bill or an, an action which he or she isn't sure is gonna succeed. So, the House of Representatives is known as the Chamber of Majority Power. If you have the majority, you have the power. The Constitution lays out as leader the Speaker of the House. That's currently Nancy Pelosi. Uh, the political leader is also the Speaker of the House. Keep in mind that I'm making a distinction between a constitutional officer. Uh, of course, this is one of the offices laid out for in the Constitution. Nancy Pelosi is um, third in line to be president, and really second after the president. The succession goes president, vice president, speaker of the House, uh, and that's laid out by the Constitution. Uh, but the speaker of the House is also the political leader of the chamber. Uh, he or she has their ceremonial tasks. Uh, they have institutional tasks, but they also have the political leadership since they were elected by the House of Representatives itself. Keep in mind, if the Democrats have the majority in the, of members of the House of Representatives, they're going to elect a Democrat. If the Republicans have control, they're going to elect a Republican. So they're not only the constitutional leader, but they're also a political leader. The majority party in the House of Representatives is overwhelmingly strong. Uh, the majority party controls the agenda, uh, and that means they should, they ought to be able to win every vote that is called on the floor. Now, that might mean a lot of wheeling and dealing behind the scenes, but the party discipline has to be really strong for the majority party to hold itself together and win every vote, especially when the margin of uh, partisanship, a partisan party power is slim. Okay, so for example, the Democrats right now have about a 30 seat uh, majority. Uh, that means they can give away a certain number of seats, uh, a certain number of votes, rather, excuse me, before they're at risk of um, losing. When I say a 30 seat majority, I mean they have about 240 seats. The Democrat the Republicans have about 202, 205, something like that. 
And so that's a 30 seat majority. What I mean is that that means you can give away about 15 votes before you're at a 219, you know, you have to have 218 to win, so to win every vote in the House. So you need to have, um, you know, the more slim your majority, the harder it is to keep winning. That means party discipline has to be really strong. Party discipline, being able to hold together your caucus, hold together your uh, members to vote on bills, even if they don't necessarily like them. Likewise, the minority party's discipline needs to be strong too, so that the minority party doesn't simply go along with whatever the majority wants. Okay, keep it. Remember when we talked about majority parties, when one of the functions of a majority party and the minority party, the majority party runs the country, it governs, it has a governing function, and then the minority party has a watchdog function. Remember that from last unit. Individual members' power is relatively weak. Uh, that's because they each individual member, one of 435, represents the parochial interests, the local interests of just one part of one state. Okay, and there's no districts except for those that are in the low population states where one congressional district equals the entirety of the state. I'm looking at you, Alaska. I'm looking at you, Wyoming and whatnot. Individual members have a limited political base. Okay, uh, their power is relatively weak because the party is so strong. Okay. Likewise, um, committees are strong in both chambers. Committees are strong. They are where the work gets done. That's where bills uh, are passed. 80% of legislation or more dies in committee. Okay. You got to make the committee chairman happy. The House of Representatives has a rules committee. Okay. The, it is where the speaker gets their power to control the flow of debate. They have their powers. Um, to impeach the president, to um, increase taxes, um, those kind of legislation has to start in the House. Now, the Senate is the chamber of political minority rights. If you are in the political minority, you have more rights because individuals in the Senate, senators, have much more individual power. They can filibuster a piece of legislation, for example. They can stop the entire process as they speak on a bill. That allows the minority a voice, and then you need a supermajority of 60 to shut down one senator from hogging up all the time. The constitutional leader in the U.S. Senate is the vice president, uh, who's constitutionally delegated to be the head of the chamber, but in practice, the vice president only appears to break ties in the Senate. Thus, the, the uh, ceremonial leadership is the president pro tempore, who by tradition is the longest tenured uh, serving senator in the majority party. Uh, the political leadership is uh, from the majority leader. They uh, Currently, it's Mitch McConnell, who's a Republican uh, senator from Kentucky. Uh, the majority party power is relatively weak in the Senate because individual members' power is so strong. If you watch the news and you hear about senators breaking with their party, that's because party discipline is relatively weak in the Senate too. Okay, the majority party's power, the political party's power, is weak in the Senate. Uh, committees are strong, just like in the House. There is no rules committee, which means there's unlimited debate on legislation. And there are special constitutional powers that the U.S. Senate has. They are the ones that try impeachments, as you might recall from earlier in the year. Uh, they give advice and consent to presidential appointments, and they ratify treaties. If you are looking at a chamber to check the power of the president, it is always the U.S. Senate. Okay. Now, we will uh, continue talking more about these two chambers, but I wanted to give you that um, contrast between the two chambers tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll talk to you soon.